from the Regency Center in San Francisco. It's theCUBE, covering Serverless Conf, San Francisco 2018. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and this is theCUBE's coverage of Serverless Conf 2018. Happy to welcome back multiple CUBE alum, Erica Windisch, who's the CTO and founder of IO Pipes. Great to see you. Thank you. All right, so Erica, I talked to you last year at AWS New York City. You also talked to John Furrier and the crew at AWS uh, New York City this year, but it's the first time we've had you on at Serverless Comp. So, before we get into some of the technology, about 500 people here, you're speaking at the show, you go to a few shows. Tell us what you think about the community in the show. Um, I mean, so it's the first day, for me at least, because we had workshops um, and a hackathon, but this is the first day of the proper conference, and you know, for me, I have to still kind of feel out the audience and see who's present. Um, honestly, I was a little afraid that these shows might have been turning more into like more vendor oriented, uh, which I don't think is necessarily the case. I think it's been good for serverless comp to be in strong developer centers because only like two, three times a year they think they're doing more, but like serverless days, which is another conference, is more like DevOps days. It's like NEC that wants to host it does it. And this conference is a little bit focused on being bigger, um, but then that means it has to be focused on hubs, like San Francisco, New York, Austin, et cetera. Um, and I, I think it's, it looks like it's doing a good job at that, um, but again, it's the first day, so I've only been able to talk to so many people. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, and I, I just spoke to uh, Michael Garski from Fender, so they, you know, they do a good job reaching out to some of the users, and what I found at least is there's many of the vendors that are here that they're using serverless, uh, they're developing serverless, so companies like, like yours. So give us the update on, on, on IOPipe. Sure, uh, so IOPipe, um, you know, we've been uh, around for a little, uh, over two years now. Um, we, let's see, um, you know, we're selling, we have a product that, you know, um, is useful and usable, and um, I would say pretty critical to building these next generation of applications. Um, because for, for me, like the products have evolved so much, probably since the last time we spoke, or, I mean definitely since the last time we spoke, but also just in the last two years, like we started out, uh, okay, how do you understand those, these serverless applications, but every people we were talking to were thinking about us and looking at us and comparing us to infrastructure monitoring. And I see our, our story changing to more about application visibility and application insights. Like, how are users using your application? When your application, fit, let's say your database fails. Like, your compute server's not going to die anymore. Like, Lambda's going to keep working. Well, when your database goes down, what does your application do? Like, you, you, let's say you're looking for a user and the user didn't exist to try and then create a new user. Like, what's your failure mode, right? Robustness of software is critical. But what happens a lot of times when your software doesn't work, you don't know why, or, or rather, you might know why it didn't work, but you don't know what that caused. You don't know what the unintentional side effects were, you know, those unknown unknowns. And, you know, tools like IOPipe are really useful for like, okay, I can now track a conversation for an Alexa skill and see how that user interacted with the skill. And if something does go wrong, I know exactly where it went wrong and what we told the user as a response, right? So we can improve the user experience, the developer experience. Um, you know, we have tools for like things like understanding um, what code path your, app, your, your, your application went down and if it's going down the wrong paths or what percentage of times it's going down, you know, an, an, an unusual, um, you know, code path, for instance. Yeah. So Erica, you said a lot has changed since uh, you know we spoke a little over a year ago. Most people, when they hear about a technology and they hear about, oh, here's what it is and here's what it isn't, kind of fossilizes in their brain. Sure. This, space is, this space is changing so fast. Give us a little insight as to what you've seen, uh, you know, serverless in general and how, how that's impacting your product. Well, I, I think serverless is definitely being used for more things. Um, you know, a lot of the early use cases are operations, um, and it's a wonderful use case for serverless. It's a great way of getting used to it and um, becoming 
you know, a custom with the development model, but you know, we're, we are seeing larger applications moving to serverless. We're seeing more lift and shift of applications to serverless um, than we did before. <laughs> um, is that a good thing? I, I, I've talked to a number of people in the community and they're like, this is wrong, don't do it. <laughs> I would say this, I, I think, um, so the term like, you know, there's pushback on the term serverless. Okay, yes there's still servers, but also state, stateless applications. There is still state. And if you, stateless, um, or I'm sorry, serverless applications or serverless infrastructures like Lambda is a stateless infrastructure for stateless applications. If you can describe your application as stateless, it is a good match for moving to serverless. Um, you know, it's one of those things like, if you have a highly stateful application, then no, you're not going to have an easy time migrating. But if you have stateless applications, a stateless architecture, um, if you've already been you know, going down that stateless rabbit hole, then serverless may not be as hard of a transition as you think it is. Excellent, that's great clarification, I appreciate that. What else, what, what are you finding, uh, what, what advice would you give to people out there uh, that, that, that are slogging their way through? Um, well, I mean, you know, try it small, right? Um, you know, have little hack day projects, have little operations projects, replace cron jobs. Um, you know, serverless can save you a lot of money, but like, honestly, start with like, re reducing things that take up uh, time from your ops team. Right, if your ops team ha is spending time on this thing, then put it into a serverless function. Yeah, that, that's great advice because you know our, our, our human resources are one of the most expensive things, and if you've got good people, they can focus on uh, more business value uh, to the business. All right, last question I have for you: Give, give us uh, kind of the roadmap and outlook for IO Pipe. Uh, you know, what, what should we be looking for, uh, kind of for the next 12 months? Um, so one of the features we're going to be announcing very shortly, um, I guess a little pre-announcement, like we're doing um, what we call auto tracing. Uh, so um, we'll be able to um, auto inspect uh, HTTP calls that originate from your functions. Uh, so you'll be able to have automatic inspection of things like you put a file in the S3. Okay, well, uh, what file did you put in the S3? Um, you know, how big was the file that you put in the S3? Um, what was its object name? Um, you make other API calls, you'll be able to see those and trace them, their timing, their parameters, things like that, their headers, automatically out of the product, uh, which of course you can also filter to make sure nothing that you don't want to go into, you know, into our services, don't, don't go. But um, you'll automatically get that capturing. Well, some of the things we introduced sort of last year were things like event um, inspection. So events come into your function, we automatically inspect them. Now we want to inspect the outcome of your function. So what is your, how, what's coming into your function and what is it doing, right? That's the IO for the IO pipe. <laughs> All right, and Erica, anything uh, from serverless in general? I, I, I guess two things I want to ask. One is, are most people you're talking to still kind of Lambda, AWS centric, uh, and any commentary around uh, kind of multi-cloud and some of the other options out there for, uh, for serverless and anything you'd be looking for as a community uh, to mature uh, to, to help this be more useful in the future? Um, so, I, I mean, I definitely hear um, more and more um, Azure. Um, I mean, if we're talking about non-AWS, I am hearing more Azure. Um, one of the issues with Azure is they have like kind of like this V2, like next generation of uh, Azure functions, which I'm kind of impatiently waiting for. Because um, I, I do think they need, they, there's a lot of architectural changes that I, I think are kind of really kind of necessary for that product. and. They're coming. Um, we just got to wait for them. <laughs> um, and I mean, I think it's just, it's maturity, right? Um, Lambda is deeply mature at this point, um, or like it's definitely mature enough. And the other services are getting there and they're getting there, you know, they're going to be there soon. But, um, you know, I'm probably waiting another, probably for the next serverless conf to start hearing, like, yes. Like we've been looking at and we're using it. Um, some of the use cases that work well on Lambda just don't work well. Like things like Slack bots don't work as well on some of the other platforms because they're cold start times and your bin packing algorithms you know, just aren't as good yet. Uh, but they're going to get there. All right, well Erica, pleasure to catch up as always. Thank, thank you for you. the update on IOPipe and everything happening in the space. And thank you so much for watching theCUBE. I'm Stu Miniman. <laughs>